Okay, uh, I'm Aldena Azmanova. I'm an associate here at the EDI uh, Economic Democracy Initiative, um, professor at the University of Kent as well. Now, I have to introduce the James Galbraith. How do you do that? <laughs> um, so as I was um, sitting across the hall in the uh, Galbraith reading, uh, Galbraith family reading room, I was thinking, you know, what I can say that you already don't know. Uh, I concluded that probably it's worth simply disclosing his next book, mm -hmm. which is Entropy Economics, coming out with um, Chicago University Press. Now, we know and value uh, James Galbraith as that irreverent spirit that does not hesitate not only to uh, critic, uh, criticize uh, right-wing orthodoxy, but very often left orthodoxy. Um, so an eminent figure in uh, US public and intellectual life. Why do we have him here? Um, he's going to present a paper that is somewhat related to entropy economics, but it is part of a larger and related project that Apolina uh, Cernev and I are about to launch. Uh, we are curating together and about to launch. Um, and this is to explore what we believe is an unprecedented potential that our historical juncture contains for emancipatory progressive social change. Uh, so we will be collecting um, the voices of, of, of um, eminent uh, figures um, in um, academia and, and politics to discuss well, both the current conundrum and um, the future paths for transformative social change. Um, it is the, the symposium would be called, take note, after neoliberalism pathways for transformative economics and politics. So, but we proceed from a very specific diagnosis that uh, Paulina and I have articulated in our recent writing, a diagnosis of liberal democracy that centers on economic insecurity or even more precisely the insecurity of livelihoods as the main, um, the most urgent issue to be addressed. So uh, we're going to launch that probably next week with contributions by Robert uh, Reich, uh, Ian Shapiro at Yale, uh, and uh, James Galbraith. So we've asked him to reflect on the impact of economic insecurity on life processes more, more generally. So let us see what he has to say about that. Jamie, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and it's a really a pleasure to be able to address this group. I'm sorry, I can't be with you in person. My well, One of my feet is in an orthopedic boot, which rather discourages that kind of mobility for the time being. But in any event, uh, it's a it's a delight to have a ch have a chance to uh, present some thoughts, which I, I developed as as Albena as Manova just told you, for a, a a project that she is that she is curating, and which is related uh, to uh, a book that's about to come out, uh, which deals with uh, what we call the biophysical basis of, uh, of of value and and production. So an attempt to address some rather uh, basic issues in in the, in the development of, of of economic thought. Um, and in this particular uh, instance, I want to offer some fair, what will emerge, I think, as some fairly gloomy uh, prognoses without necessarily being able to tell you how I would uh, cure these prognoses because the the, uh, the causal factors are, are, are rather difficult to control. But in any event, with understanding them is, is a, perhaps a first a first step uh, toward addressing what may become a fairly serious concern in the over the medium term future. Uh, I want to begin uh, you, by reminding you of uh, a concept that I'm sure you're familiar with, became familiar with, uh, if you weren't already, uh, over the course of the 
of the last three years in particular during the, the COVID pandemic, which is what's known as the R value or the reproduction rate of a, of, of a process. It's a multiplicative factor uh, that uh, tells you can tell you a great many things if it's accurately measured, including, for example, the rate at which a, uh, a particular infection will be transmitted from one, one person to the next. That was the context in which it was used uh, to describe the progress of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, and um, a, uh, uh, it's also got many other applications, including, for example, atomic bombs, uh, where uh, the R value is two because each neutron crashing into an atom of plutonium or uranium-235 produces two neutrons. And over the course of 80 generations, uh, it happened in what, 300 millionths of a second, you get enough release of energy, according to Einstein's principles, to obliterate a city. So if you're interested in obliterating cities, this is a useful formula to have in mind. Uh, the origins of this idea are uh, in demography from about a century century ago from uh, Lotka of the Lotka Volterra models. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the principle uh, is, uh, applies to uh, equally if R is greater or less than one. Uh, and if it happens to be less than one, uh, then an epidemic or reaction uh, tends to fizzle uh, and eventually heads toward asymptotically toward toward zero. And this is how characteristically epi epidemics uh, come to an end. Um, the, uh, uh, OK, now this is just to frighten you a little bit and to give bad memories to those who have British connections. Uh, but uh, the R value was uh, this. I saw this in Nature this morning when I was looking uh, for something to illustrate the R value. And I couldn't think of anything better than 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 uh, reminding those of you uh, for whom it matters about uh, the uh, Rather uh, deeply unlamented Boris Johnson. Okay, I won't. I won't rub that. Rub that in. But never mind. Go on. Uh, the point I would make is that uh, uh, that this was these questions of demography even before this particular concept was developed were of very great interest uh, to in classical political economy, uh, where uh, it was well understood that the R value, that is the basic. Uh, um, the basic um, reproduction rate of the human species was very high. Uh, that is to say, fertility rates were high, and if fertility rates are above a certain level, there's a tendency for the human population uh, to increase and to increase uh, explosively over time. Uh, and that uh, is uh, a, led to uh, you know, the classical view of population dynamics. Uh, which was that uh, the population was checked by the uh, by the biblical horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, namely war, famine, pestilence, and death. Uh, these uh, checks to uh, the ability or the, uh, the capacity of humans to to procreate and reproduce. Uh, the, uh, so to take the eminent political uh, economist Durer, uh, Durer of 1498, there's this classic print of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but the theme uh, resonates down to our, our time. I have a more recent version below, although the, the young artist who apparently drew this uh, couldn't remember the fourth one and has a substitute sorcery for pestilence, but we allow uh, a, a, a some some artistic license in, in, in that matter, in any event. Uh, these matters were, to just to bring things up a little bit, uh, very, very well known to uh, the, the leaders of classical political economy. I won't read the whole quotation from Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, but uh, it, it, it was, he, he observes uh, uh, a calculation or reports of calculation is actually due to Benjamin Franklin uh, that while the population of Europe was essentially stagnant at the time, that in North America was doubling every 20 or 25 years. Uh, and uh, this was because of uh, an extreme absence of austerity or precarity. Uh, that is to say, the very, very low resource costs and a very high return uh, to having children and including their value uh, as uh, in, in adding to household wealth. And he notes that uh, the labor of each child before it can leave their house is computed to be worth 100 pounds clear gain uh, to them. A young widow with four or five children, uh, young children 
children who among middling or inferior ranks of people in Europe would have so little chance for a second husband is freak is there frequently courted as a sort of fortune. The value of children is the greatest of all encouragements uh, to marry. So he has a very clear sense of the underlying uh, economic incentives behind uh, the reproduction or non-reproduction uh, of, of the population. Uh, and at that time, uh, North America was an example of uh, of a very favorable circumstance. I have a an example here uh, of a, a case of this, which is this is a house in Vermont, which, as it happens, I happen to own. Uh, it was built in in 1776, uh, and it was built uh, on very bad land on the top of a hill. Why was it built there? Uh, because there, the, the land being bad, the trees were relatively sparse and they could be cleared and planted in a season. Uh, and then what happened over the course of time was that uh, uh, the settlers moved down the hills into thicker forests with better soil. And as they did that, uh, the yields on their crops returned, eventually increased. They eventually abandoned the farming or ranching on the hilltops. Uh, and the settlements are all, main settlements are all now in the valleys with communication is better, soil is better, and so forth, to the extent that anybody farms there at all. Uh, but this was a matter of increasing returns uh, in agriculture, which greatly improved uh, the prospects for population growth. And that is why, by the time uh, 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 that General Johnny Burgoyne marched down toward uh, uh, from, uh, toward uh, New York, uh, the uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys, teenagers basically, were numerous enough to go and stop him at Bennington and Saratoga, uh, which is why we are we are. But the uh, uh, this is uh, just an example of how uh, the conditions uh, for population expansion in North America were opposite of what was uh, the what one might call conventional wisdom in Europe at the time uh, of diminishing returns and uh, the, the tendency toward misery in the population. Increasing returns changed that entirely. That continued in North America for, for a very long time. Uh, Malthus, uh, writing in 1798, uh, very much in the mode of uh, the traditional European population, uh, is uh, uh, population conditions uh, is uh, uh, you know a, the obvious uh, enduring exemplar of the of the traditional view. Uh, in in his essay on population, he, he begins by contemplating whether it's possible, as someone had named Godwin had uh, suggested, for human perfectibility to erase the uh, deplorable tendency of the. Of, of men and women to do various things together, which have unfortunate consequences. Uh, and he reports that he's not optimistic about this towards the extinction of the passion <laughs> between the sexes. No progress, whatever hitherto has been made. A very sad uh, conclusion. Uh, and the result of which he, he concludes is that the power of population is indefinitely greater than the power in the earth to produce subsistence uh, for man. Uh, and after that, you get the famous uh, population when unchecked increases in a geometrical ratio, subsistence increases only in an arithmetical ratio. So the, the classic Malthusian uh, dilemma uh, and uh, the result of which is that uh, the check on human population has to happen uh, after people have already been born and not before uh, as a result of the of, of the of the classical phenomena of war, a pestilence, famine, and their consequence, death. But this changed. This was not a uh, permanent, at least it was not uh, something which continued into the 19th century, or at least past the first half of the 19th century. Uh, and remarkably so, uh, in part because initially uh, of the extremely favorable conditions in North America, uh, and as uh, people moved on from New England into the Ohio value, Valley and into the Plains generally, uh, the conditions simply became more and more favorable, uh, which is why the population of the North expanded rapidly enough uh, with the help of industrialization uh, to uh, accentuate the increase in farm outputs, why the North won the Civil War, but it also produced uh, surpluses which could be exported to Europe and support the growth of population there, but not just in, in not just North America, the same similar phenomenon happened in Russia, uh, whose population, according to Keynes, increased by 50% uh, in the half century before 
1914. Uh, and then you also had, as a result of the improvements in, 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 in capacity, you had beginnings of modernization uh, in the city, so especially water and sewers, so the getting of improvement in public health and what were really deplorable conditions at the start of the Industrial Revolution, which were amply documented by Marx. Uh, became uh, somewhat more tolerable. And the result of that, again, was a higher survival rate of the population. Uh, Keynes, in 1919, uh, in Economic Consequences of the Peace, uh, remarks on this as the preconditions for the First World War, uh, that uh, numbers increased, food was actually easier to secure. And he's uh, the interdependence of increasing returns uh, in industry and agriculture uh, is very much uh, noticed by him uh, and its effect. Uh, he says that by the turn of the 20th century, perhaps the North American phenomenon was beginning to tail off. But at that point, colonization of Africa is yielding uh, an extra bonus for the European diets in the form of oil seeds. Um, and so he draws the conclusion that uh, before the 18th century, mankind entertained no false hopes. To lay the illusions which grew popular at that age is latter end, that is to say, uh, Adam Smith. Uh, Malthus disclosed a devil. For half a century, all serious economical writings held that devil in clear prospect. For the next half century, he was chained up and out of sight. And then Kane speculates that perhaps he's back again, but he wasn't. Uh, what happened in the 20th century was the, uh, the devil really uh, got got locked up pretty tight. I mean, they, again, the expansion of, of, of clean water and clean sewer, major effects is something Angus Deaton has written about. Uh, personal hygiene. Uh, I'm, my understanding is that before the mid 20th century, very few Frenchmen had ever taken a, 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 a bath or used soap. Uh, but they started doing so and became a, a product that was uh, uh, was widely disseminated. Uh, the control of mosquitoes, uh, the much maligned DDT, uh, eliminated the threat of malaria. Uh, in the industrial regions. I, my mother got malaria on Long Island in 1920s. I'll give you an idea just how far uh, that scourge was, was in, essentially uh, relegated to, uh, to, the, to the tropical uh, less developed regions. Electrification, refrigeration, improving the quality of food. Uh, the arrival of the automobile, which just reduces the amount of infectious waste left by animals on on city streets, uh, eventually the invention of antibiotics, not until really the Second World War when much of this had already occurred. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the um, uh, availability of very abundant, very clean, uh, relatively low cost energy from uh, you know, more advanced fossil fuels, oil and, and natural gas. Uh, and you have uh, a, uh, a boom in both uh, fertility and life expectancy together, with the result that, every, as everybody knows, that the world population uh, it went up, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a phenomenal and obviously historically completely unprecedented and uh, non-reproducible manner, from just about let's see one uh, one billion in 1800, two billion uh, uh, between well, 1928 is with the eight for two billion to uh, eight billion at the moment. And and with 10 billion projected by uh, 2058. So uh, really quite quite an extraordinary uh, accomplishment for the species, not necessarily so good for, for the planet as a whole for other species, but there, there, there it is. Um, in any event, uh, so I wanna speak a little bit about how economics uh, dealt with this question uh, after World War II, uh, the arrival of what I think is still the dominant textbook economics uh, incorporated this concept into growth theory, which basically uh, dismissed Malthus, uh, also dismissed Marx, uh, gave us the view that productivity and real wages would rise more or less together, uh, that the labor force would be just grow uh, independently of economic forces. This was taken as a contrib contribution to total growth, total output, and part of the production function. Uh, and that resources uh, which are required to support this uh, were either available, if they weren't available, other things could substitute for them, uh, or new technologies could be developed that would make 
particular set of resources. This is a pattern over uh, cited as the historical pattern and one which was confidently expected to continue. And I have below some pictures of uh, Robert Solo and William Nordhaus and you know, identified with these views, generally speaking. Uh, there was, of course, 50 years ago and then in uh, the uh, Limits to Growth Club of Rome, uh, uh, effort, uh, uh, an attempt to challenge uh, this conclusion, but it was uh, dismissed as neo-Malthusian and uh, essentially became something which only only dissident fringe in the economics profession could uh, uh, would advocate and that would and only had a very significant professional cost. It was something that was really excluded. Uh, and I recall this very well from my own graduate school education in the 70s. It was something that you you were you were very uh, persuasively warned away from if you wanted to survive in academic economics. Climate change, a more recent concern, was hardly discussed. It was, it was There was some awareness of it, but uh, it was certainly not the concern that it became uh, from the 1990s and 2000s onwards. Uh, so, uh, what did happen uh, in, in the in the discussion of, of demography uh, was the arrival of a kind of a neoclassical economics of the of the family of which of which Gary Becker of the University of Chicago was a, a leading exponent. Uh, and uh, he saw children as consumer durables, a very interesting perspective with the idea that as, uh, as wealthier. Uh, that qual women would choose or families would choose quality over quantity. Uh, that's saying that rather than buying two Westinghouse dishwashers, you'd buy just one that was a Bosch. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how that translates into the, well, the metaphor uh, translates from children to dishwashers, but nevertheless, uh, the authority of Gary Becker was 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 uh, reinforced by the Swedish Riksbank Prize at one point. So who am I to question it? Uh, there were also approaches from feminist scholars later on, which I would characterize uh, as as having. Um, and perhaps unfairly, but as being largely concerned with the problem of family and career and trying to reconcile uh, those two things as an age when 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 when, uh, when women were uh, uh, effectively seeking uh, liberation from from the from the previous from their previous confinements and particular occupations. Uh, but what these analyses, I think, share uh, is an understanding that the uh, decision to re reproduce is a, is a private matter. It's a matter which is which is vested in the household and and and, and in and, and the woman. Uh, may be influenced by external events. Obviously, if you ask the present speaker of the house uh, his view, he would ask for dictatorial powers over, but he's not likely to get them uh, in the sense that, uh, well, in, in legislatures, including in Texas, are constantly meddling in these questions. And by and large, uh, their effectiveness in doing so can be uh, can be uh, uh, Treated as something which is which is not going to be decisive. So this is an ultimate sort of micro foundation of uh, the future of, of 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 the species and of of the supply of of labor and everything else to the uh, uh, to the economy. You know, so here's here's Gary Becker and I I, I pulled out a, a, a quote to give you a, kind of a sense of the of the sort of uh, thing that he was concerned with. This is about the total output of the polygynous household. Uh, and uh, it, it, he calculates using optimization theory how uh, the more wives you have, the fewer children each one will have, and yada, yada, yada. I, did, I don't think it needs much comment. That's the kind of thing that, uh, that seemed to be fashionable in, in the early 60s or the 1980s. Um, but uh, what I want to talk about now, and the time I have and move on to, 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 the, to the kinds of concerns that it seems to me we ought to be thinking about is uh, these are micro decisions, but they have macro foundations. And in a wealthy country, the macro foundations are of a kind that I think all of us are basically familiar with. It's not something that uh, uh, is a mystery. So uh, let's ask ourselves, what are the macro foundations for these many millions of micro decision makers in the wealthy countries around the world, where one we can observe uh, that common phenomenon 
is happening. The common phenomenon is decline in fertility rates, uh, and depending on the population structure, that will translate over time uh, into peaking and uh, decline in population. Already in some countries, including China, where the decline in fertility was accentuated by public policy, uh, the one-child policy, you're seeing already peaking and decline in population. And, and the UN estimates that the world population will, will, will peak in, in maybe, what, 50 years. Uh, so... What, what, what's at issue here? Well, first of all, and this comes to, uh, you know, in some sense, uh, an argument that's rooted in the very simple concepts that, that I would call the biophysical basis of these decisions, production decisions, uh, is that there are, there are costs associated. And in rich countries, the costs associated with having children are really quite quite high. First of all, you have to feed them and you have to clothe them and you have to supply them with electronics and various other things, uh, which you would not have to do if they didn't exist. You have to house them, which means generally speaking, you need more housing than you would need if you didn't have children. You have to educate them. Now, in advanced countries, education is provided by the community up to a certain level, but in advanced countries, uh, and the wealthier you get, the more non-provided or privately provided education you need. College and graduate school is very expensive. So you have to provide for that in advance, so you have to entertain them, and you have to put up with the aggravation of having children, which is not insubstantial if they, you have children, <laughs> you're probably aware of it. Um, so there are all these things, and in addition to that, you have to worry about uncertainty. So there's a question of uh, you know what happens to these kids, do they have accidents, do they have disabilities, do they have uh, uh, do they get involved? Do they do they commit crimes? Do you have to hire lawyers for them? Uh, uh, do you have to go visit them in juvenile detention? You know, they, you don't know these things ex ante when you. So there's there's a hot, an uncertainty element associated with this very long term uh, commitment that you you have when you decide to go through it with actually producing them. I'm not saying that there aren't reasons to have children. I'm just saying that there that the cost <laughs> factors are are, are, are are present and some and people are are generally speaking. I don't think it's controversial to say people are aware of them. Um, and then there's the opportunity cost, which is uh, that the more children you have, the less time you have, the more commuting you have to do, the more driving you have to do, the more uh, management of their social lives you have to do, the more discipline you have to inflict and so on. Plus, the less you have opportunities to uh, have separate careers and, or advance your careers and have keep uh, keep jobs uh, that have good career ladders. So you have a certain amount of foregone income. All of that's pretty pretty well straightforward. Um, now, there's also lost incentives. Uh, Adam Smith, as I, in the quotation I gave you, is, uh, you know, children were an asset. They were something which you immediately, as soon as they could toddle, essentially, you could put them to work. Well, in the modern urban household, how much work do children actually do? Uh, like taking out the trash, maybe, but even that is not, uh, uh, there's no farm work to speak of. Uh, uh, there's not that much housework that you can entrust to your children unless your children are substantially uh, more disciplined and uh, obedient than mine were. Um, and only, they may have talents, and many of them do have talents, but very few of those talents uh, <laughs> uh, uh, yield, yield income to the household. I, uh, I, I, I have an exceedingly talented daughter who is a movie star, but the movie didn't make any money. So, you know, this is the, uh, uh, the re reality of it. Uh, but the, in addition to that, uh, unlike the previous uh, era, you don't need the kids when you're old. This is a fundamental success of, uh, of, of the 20th century welfare state in all of the wealthy societies of the world. Uh, in the old days, you needed to have a lot of children so that you would have one or two who tolerated you, uh, with whom you could live uh, when they were productive citizens, and you could move into an attic room and, uh, you know, generally speaking, haunt them for the rest of your life. Um, but this is no longer necessary. Public pension, Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, or public health care in other countries. Uh, and basically, the elderly population is one of the most emancipated populations that's out there. They're, as I say this, as I get older, as I've gotten older myself, it's really quite extraordinary how 
favored it is, among other things you have. Of course, you've had tax favored savings schemes, which you benefit from when you get to a certain age. There are old age communities in which people go to, and they seem to prefer that over living with their children or else their children prefer it and won't have their parents live with them. Um, and so all of this has reorganized social life in a way. And then there's the, you know, there's wealth hoarding of which home ownership is a substantial element. If you, uh, previous populations were largely renters and didn't carry equity with them, but if you own homes, you you tend to have a, a, a pile of something that's worth something to you after a certain period of time. So the wealthy, the, the older are, are, are wealthy and their need to, for uh, the support of adult children isn't very large, which raises the question, if you anticipate this, why bother having children in the first place? Let other people's children support you in old age. Uh, uh, of course, that's a collective ag ac action problem with a certain a certain downside, which is what I want to get to. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, then to bring this into, uh, you know, into the domain, which, which really has been uh, greatly, I think the discussion of which has been greatly advanced by Albena Asmanova's book, uh, Capitalism on Edge. We have to consider that the policies that we have been pursuing on top of the achievements of the 20th century welfare state have um, you know, made this economic uh, decision-making considerably uh, more uh, difficult, uh, reducing the margin uh, of, 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 uh, that you have for making, a, making expansive decisions about, about childbearing and childrearing. Austerity uh, obviously reduces the margin of free income, uh, and forces the economy, uh, the household into making economies. Uh, well, not having more children is uh, certainly one of the major economies that's available to a micro decision maker. You can't really economize on the heating bill or the, or the water bill or the, uh, uh, or the tax bill, the property tax bill, the income tax bill, but you can economize on the number of kids you have. And it's, it's natural to expect that a fair number of households will do so. And it's not just public austerity, uh, that uh, makes that uh, decision, uh, you know, more uh, you know, more compelling. It's also rising resource costs, rising interest rates. So you can expect that uh, that monetary policy, financial crises, anything that uh, that makes the dis makes the economic condition of the broad population uh, more difficult is going to have a depressing effect on the reproduction on fertility of the reproduction rate and that's actually observed there's major declines in the early 1970s there's major declines uh, after the financial crisis in, in 2007 uh, these things are the biological rate of return as, as my co-author Jing Chen and I call it in our book uh, has fallen uh, with the rise of resource costs the imposition of austerity policies. And then there's precarity. Uh, again, Albana has been the leading voice in you know, bringing this question front and center. It's distinct from austerity, it's distinct from inequality. Uh, but what it does is it places a premium on protecting yourself, that is to say, on self-insurance uh, by uh, having multiple income, uh, multiple income earners in the household. Uh, and uh, that enables you to protect the standard of living from occasional unemployment or temporary employment, various kinds with, uh, with variable incomes. Uh, and so uh, this was, uh, uh, th this, this I think aggravates to a very substantial extent, uncertainty about the future, uh, especially if you just need to get to the age of early retirement, the age of Medicare uh, is uh, uh, you know, another incentive uh, to uh, uh, not impose your uncertainties on a, on a succeeding generation. There is a minor exception for the top creditor class of Elon Musk has 12 children. H.L. Hunt had seven. Uh, the father of Nelson Bunker, William Herbert Hunt, was in my generation who tried to uh, corner the silver market in 1980 and went bankrupt afterwards. Uh, let's say there is God. Uh, but uh, they... Uh, I was involved in the investigation of the silver corner in 1980s. So this is something I remember with a certain amount of pleasure. Uh, but in any event, yes, the top, the top creditor class is able to have uh, the kind of luxuries that Adam Smith uh, saw having the, the whole yeoman farmer class enjoying, but most of the rest of us do not. Uh, okay. Uh, so what are the implications? And I think I'm coming to... Uh, uh, I think I've taken about 30, 35 minutes. So this is the, the about the last or second to last slide. Well, what are the implications if 
you know, allowing for all of the nice reasons you have for wanting children, and you might have some anyway, uh, the effect of uh, the economic factors is to depress the reproduction rate so it falls below one. Uh, basically, in a stable age profile, which is not what you have, it's going to depress the, uh, uh, it's consistent with the fertility rate below, I think, about 2.1. Uh, and the answer to that is, of course, the population is going to get older. Uh, and as the population gets older, the burden of caring for the elderly increases. And there's a certain uh, uh, competition for resources, infrastructure resources. Nursing homes crowd out schools, for example, uh, in the limited uh, limited public budget. I don't think that's, that's, uh, that's particularly controversial, uh, which then places and increases the, the the variable cost associated with or maybe the fixed cost associated with having your own children so you have to provide uh for them independently of the public provision uh so uh the economics of this become uh progressively less favorable over time uh there's a phenomenon as the birth cohort uh the birth age cohort declines that will compound the decline in fertility. And this, I, I noticed this particularly on a visit to Russia about three, four years ago. Um, and the, uh, the, the Russian population suffered a terrific shock uh, demographically in the 1990s and very few children were born. And as a result in the 2020s, there are not that many women of childbearing age. And although uh, with a really aggressive and successful policy of promoting fertility and making it, making children, uh, you know, an attractive proposition economically in Russia, the numbers of them are not very large. They're made up for the moment by immigration from other post-Soviet states and from Ukraine, especially, uh, but that's uh, that was a challenge that the Russians are going to face over time. Uh, so, uh, as the population gets older, uh, there's a substantial risk of uh, one of these Malthusian cullings, like the pandemic, which the mortality rates much higher for the for the vulnerable elderly, but that you might think would reduce the the burden of the elderly because there are fewer of them. But the problem with that is that the fixed facilities for them are still there. And unless there's a systematic reduction of them, that just means that the per person cost of maintaining an old person goes up. So you have, uh, you don't have a, a very large saving uh, and there are more old people as the general population ages. Anyway, so not, uh, it, it doesn't seem to have a dramatic effect on population dynamics. The result of this, as I would argue, is that there's just not an easy exit from a situation where the reproduction rate for a population falls below, below one. In the case of the United States, immigration uh, makes up for it, but only so long as the for the for the immigrant, it's more attractive to come to the richer country than it is to stay uh, in the in the country of origin, and that's a that that will that attractiveness that margin of attractiveness will diminish almost surely over time as the standing of the, the relative standing of the U.S. and its advantages uh, tends to diminish. So, if that's the case. What are we looking at over a long time scale? We're looking at a progressive diminution of the human population uh, and uh, a, a progressive increase in the uh, pressures uh, for further diminution. So it's very hard to see. Uh, I'm happy to entertain any suggestions about how this process might be reversed. Obviously, conquering some new territories, discovering new resources, uh, and so forth are, are are possible. But or you know, they're but have they've been tried and. In past centuries, and it's fair to say that the opportunities for doing that are not so great in the world as it is today uh, that they were in previous centuries. So we ruling out that you know that that kind of rather brutal way to improve your own population's prospects uh, in the modern world uh, seems to me the more likely outcome is that over a long time the human population will just decrease. Uh, uh, Time scale is probably uh, less than it will take the East Antarctic uh, ice sheet to melt. Uh, and so we may end up in a situation where we still have the ice sheets, but we don't have any people uh, to uh, com to contribute further to climate change. Uh, so long-term consequences, uh, I guess I've already basically gone through this. Uh, demographic decline for almost all wealthy countries. Few cases, immigration will will tend to mitigate that for a while, but not indefinitely. And ultimately, the, the populations of the poorer countries, which are not subject to the same pressures, will come to dominate the human population. Uh, countries with 
very young populations, even though they have declining fertility. India is an example, uh, are still growing. Uh, the populations of Nigeria and Pakistan, uh, the fertility rates are declining, but they're still above the reproduction, above, above the, uh, the replacement rate. And so those populations will continue to grow for quite some time. They will become the dominant populations in the world over a you know, fairly uh, fairly uh, foreseeable time span. Uh, but uh, ultimately, nothing stops them uh, from becoming wealthier countries or wealthier populations wherever they may find themselves uh, and ultimately going through the same transitions. The same forces will affect those populations that have affected Western Europe, North America, uh, China, Japan uh, now for some time. So, and the question is, what, what's the future of the human species? And I just will leave you on the encouraging note that there may not be one. And uh, uh, remind you, I'm not the first person to have thought about these questions. So I, I leave you with some uh, greater, more talented uh, wordsmiths than myself. Uh, the first one is, of course, Kipling, for called our navies melt away on dune and headland sinks the fire. Lo, all our pomp of yesterday is one with Nineveh and Tyre. The second one is I really love because I once put it into the congressional record uh, to celebrate the inauguration of Ronald Reagan's economic program. It's Archibald McLeish's The End of the World. And there, there overhead, there, there hung over those thousands of white faces, those dazed eyes. There in the starless dark, the poise, the hover there with vast wings across the canceled skies. There in the southern blackness, the black pall of nothing, nothing, nothing at all. Uh, and finally, of course, Eliot, uh, this is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang, but a whimper. Thank you, and have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs>
which you mentioned, but you say some countries have managed it because of migration, but that seems to be just purely economically the obvious answer. Yes, there will be resistance and so on, but then the problem is not overall humanity declining. The problem then is, if you like, the political and social constraints to people moving. So I'm just wondering whether you would want to put both of those factors in to the discussion. And finally, just on your last point, I mean, it's probably likely that we'll blow up the planet before we all perish. The human mm -hmm. if the causation is more likely to be the other way, or like, or like if all, if you like, the speed of change, <laughs> <laughs> given that the ice caps are melting, that but we humanity is probably going to be more able to destroy the planet faster than we stop reproducing ourselves. But anyway, just three points to put yeah. it, 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 it may be a race between uh, your problem, you, 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 a race between our capacity to destroy things and our our capacity to uh, to to vanish on our own account. So that that that's an an, an open question that we can we, we probably you and I will not be around to observe the uh, the outcome of that particular race. But but maybe by the time some of the people in the audience are there, it will, it will they'll, they'll they'll have they'll have a better fix. On it, um, you know, it's of course true that the overall rise in population has been uh, due to declining death rates. Uh, but the, you know, the, the, the death will come to us all. Uh, there is a the, the, the death rates will not decline indefinitely, uh, and uh, so that uh, is a transitional. You know, is is an important, obviously, a, a very important transitional factor. Um, but it's not going to be an increase in the death rates of the Malthusian type that's going to uh, be the at least it doesn't appear to be the going to be the decisive matter. Now, maybe uh, there is a sort of ultimate Malthusian risk called nuclear war, um, which we will. Which I, I, I didn't. I, I, I couldn't bring myself to mention that as well, because I figured I'd, I'd, I'd spoiled the mood enough already with, with the remarks I'd already made. Uh, but leaving that aside, uh, the, it's, it seems to me that calling attention to uh, what's happening to uh, the to fertility and birth rates uh, raises some interesting questions. Now, you mentioned that just, I'm not the first person to have thought of this. I don't claim to be. Uh, I, I have sort of scanned the, the literature uh, and particularly some of the of the authors that you mentioned uh, uh, or that you refer to, uh, you know, but and I'm not really sure uh, that I see the kind of, of argument that I was just making, uh, at least foregrounded, uh, because it seems to me the priorities uh, uh, in at least much of that uh, of that writing uh, has been on uh, you know trying to trying to reconcile uh, the uh, various priorities, particularly facing uh, improving the condition of women generally and giving them uh, you know uh, the kind of liberation that they've been seeking for for uh, you know at least the last several centuries. Uh, and I'm not I'm not, I'm not not disapproving of that at all. Uh, I'm just saying that, the, that I think they, this you look at a phenomenon which is universal to the wealthier countries, not to the poorer countries. Um, although it's already happening, as I said, in, in India, the decline in fertility rates. Uh, so it's, let's just say, much further advanced in the wealthiest countries. You know, sort of have to ask, why is that the case? Uh, and there, it seems to me that this balance of, of, of fixed commitments associated with the decision to have children uh, and the pressure on household budgets associated with austerity and precarity are the things I would I would I would foreground and I would emphasize uh, that, that is quite that makes uh, that makes it uh, uh, let's say uh, highly advantageous not to have the kinds of families that were absolutely prevalent uh, in the uh, uh, you know, in, pre in the let's say in the agricultural phase of of of, uh, of development, or in the in the let's say the major increasing returns phase of industrial development, uh, and so we're seeing this. Um, so I'm not entirely sure. It is true to make your to address your other point that 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 there will be uh, you know, there that migration, as I said, mitigates this question, and it's, uh, that's another social conflict that that comes up with it comes along. But ultimately, people who migrate 
come to the United States, come to Europe, come to the and uh, absorbed into the uh, existing systems in those countries, you're going to have the same incentive structures that people who are already there. Uh, so why that would be a uh, you know let's say a permanent fix, I don't see. Uh, and I, if if it happens that the sending countries also enjoy perhaps greater control of their own resources and the, the level of exploitation declines and they are build up some of the same uh, social insurance and other structures that are associated with development, I don't see why that uh, the same processes don't uh, affect them as well. And in fact, we can see that they already do, uh, f- that even though... Uh, the fertility rates are still above replacement rate in, let's say, Nigeria and Pakistan. They've been falling substantially from what they were before. No surprise. Uh, in Bangladesh, even more so. Uh, the, uh, even more so, the point where the demographic balance between Bangladesh and Pakistan is very different from what it was 50 years ago when Bangladesh became independent. It's quite remarkable. At that time, Bangladesh was a larger, had a larger population. It's not the case now. It's I don't know what the difference is. Fifty percent, something like that, is very substantial. Um, okay. Um, any other questions, observations? Just yes. right, quick one. Um, okay. I think you have to go on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, if, if you could just comment on the recent case of uh, the Chinese uh, government. I think there was an article just the other day in the New York Times that they want to reverse their, um, they want to get women back in the home to reproduce. Uh, it, China, of course, is an exceptional case because of their one child policy. However, it is important because they do represent such a massive uh, popula- uh, sector of the population. So if you have any comments on the Chinese situation. Well, I, I, I guess my view is the Chinese government is, as always, trying to cope with a problem when it sees one. Uh, but the Chinese uh, the fertility rate in China uh, is down to like 1.2. Uh, and this is not the one child policy has been relaxed, uh, but the, you know, the China has under, undergone an enormous uh, shift from being a substantially rural population to being a substantially urban population and from being one which was family centered to being one which is like any urban population much more broadly uh, based than that. Uh, And so I do not see how the Chinese government any more than the Japanese government, any other government uh, is going to be able to overcome the fact that the existing population is going to get older uh, and is not going to be replaced. And China has already gone over the the transition to a actually falling population, which is not the case in India. Uh, So, I mean, I would say good luck, but uh, it would not surprise me if the projections that show China's population falling to, you know, half or less of what it is presently over the decades to come, uh, turn out to be true. Uh, Why would the, I mean, you can obviously encourage, uh, uh, you can provide all kinds of incentives for people to have more children it doesn't mean they want they're going to do so. You can't force them, uh, and so uh, that's uh, it. Strikes me as a very difficult problem. Uh, it's a problem which is being addressed has been addressed by policy in Russia. Uh, there's very clear, very strong uh, pro. Uh, natality policies, uh, and they had some effect in fertility, but they're not changing the overall uh, you know, balance of population in Russia. Uh, France has had such policies for a very long time. The fertility rates in France are not at the replacement rate. Uh, so uh, again, you can encourage people. You, it's, it's a good thing, I suppose, if you do. Uh, I don't have an objection to it, but the, ultimately the decision still rests on on the individual and the factors affecting that are uh, you know, among those factors are the ones that I've just described. So it, it's really quite inconsistent in the case of Western Europe to have strong, uh, you know, pro-fertility <laughs> policies and at the same time inflict austerity on the larger population, which completely defeats the incentive structure that you're trying to create. Any other questions? Yes, Mr. Mm-hmm. 
Hi, just wanted to ask one question. I I I, I think was you know a very very provoking thought provoking presentation. I wonder uh, to what extent do you believe? Uh, and I agree that austerity is a fundamental driver in in that phenomenon. But is it to what extent is it also a cultural issue? Because uh, kind of drawing upon the the, the comment of feminist economics. Uh, it, and, and, and thinking about, for example, the case of South Korea, right? It's a place where it's a prosperous society, but the gender expectations in terms of what women are supposed to to do in, in, in terms of the division of labor are so oppressive that they rather not have children because they it's just, you know, they are expected to, to bear the entire burden of, of, of of care. But but also it I think it's you know it extends to every country. Uh, so is to what extent is it austerity driven and to what extent is it a cultural thing that we need to really discuss the division of labor in terms of care? Well, uh, to the extent that I have, and I'm, I'm, I feel far from being the world's greatest expert on this literature, which I'll admit immediately, uh, but to the extent that I've, I've, I've looked into that, uh, the arguments I've seen point to certain cultures as having uh, basically uh, defied the, these traditions because they have very strong uh, uh, roots or it's very strong community bases in large families. Uh, and that uh, the largest uh, community is, is Islamic. Uh, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Judaism is a, another example. Mormonism is another example. Uh, these are not, uh, the latter two are not substantial enough to make a big difference to the world population. Uh, so, uh, but there, you know, that there are some cultural factors However, you know, if you want to make it into a primarily cultural story, then you're going to find uh, very substantial cross-national, cross-cultural differences. Um, and the answer to that is you don't appear to. Uh, there may be somewhat more, somewhat less in other pla in certain places. Korea is an example of a very heavily depressed uh, uh, fertility rates. Uh, but it's also, I mean, it seems to me the overwhelming fact is that uh, the high income countries and the countries which have, uh, you know, essentially become social democracies and the countries which are, uh, which, which are not resource, which are resource dependent, which is true of Korea, true of Japan, uh, true of Western Europe are the ones where these pressures are the are the greatest and where the where the biological rate of return has been has, has fallen as well. So I would I, I'm I'm inclined to to weight the common factors more heavily than the idiosyncratic ones simply because the the pattern of common movement is so is so is so substantial. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Anybody else want to yes please Hi, I just wondered if you had any thoughts on um, like the balance of power between uh, older and younger voters in the system, because it seems to me that the massive power of the older age voting bloc um, plays a part in accelerating the conditions that you're talking about and making politically impossible proposals around, for example, um, there was time some, and age. And I wonder if you had any thoughts. There's some echo there. Can you, can you, I don't maybe step okay. back from the microphone a little bit and say that again. I'm, I'm sorry. Sure. Is that better now? Maybe. Go ahead. <laughs> I'll speak a bit more slowly. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the balance of power in, um, between older and younger voters in, in, uh, advanced democracies, um, in making politically impossible proposals around, for example, increasing the retirement age. And relatedly, whether you had any thoughts on the proposal to massively increase suffrage, for example, by lowering the voting age to children as young as like 12 or 13. Okay. Uh, well, I, I would guess that my, my first observation would be that as the proportion of as the population drifts toward older um, uh, echelons, uh, the relative power of the old increases. Uh, and the old are not a very generous group. Uh, as I get older, I feel less generous myself. Uh, so they're, they, they, um, uh, I don't see how 
uh, one has a natural corrective simply if you have a voter preference view. Uh, the old are wealthy, uh, they are self-interested, uh, and so they will they, they they will they will take care of their of their of their own resource needs. Uh, leave the, let the, let let the young uh, labor <laughs> to support them. Uh, so that strikes me as a as as a, it may be what you need is 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 not to have democracy. I mean, I'm not not I'm, I'm enough of a Democrat to be uh, skeptical of that solution as well. Uh, they uh, things tend to go wrong. Uh, so there's 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 uh, that's uh, not to give, sorry not to be terribly encouraging. Um, and I had one other captious thought uh, associated with your question, but I now cannot. Being old, I can't quite re recollect what it was. Uh, the uh, so I'll I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you, Jamie. Um, it seems that. You know, since austerity and precarity are politically gener generated. So uh, the one thing we can do is really urgently push back with anti-precarity policies. And this is what we will be, uh, what we're discussing here and what we will be plotting further in this new um, online symposium after neoliberalism. We're very happy to have you on board with that as well. So thank yep. you. To let, 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 let me offer two. two. If, since it, it really is obligatory to say a couple of encouraging things, um, first of all, first first of all, uh, that uh, on the on the subject of which now we're calling of early retirement, uh, that is a device to exclude from the benefits of social security those parts of the population that don't live so long. So it's a characteristic device to make social security in the United States, for example, less accessible to, let's say, African-American populations who uh, don't have the same life expectancy uh, that a wealthier elements of the society do. So I, I regard that as really being a very, uh, has been, having been and continuing to be a very pernicious kind of, uh, a, a, of approach. And in fact, uh, if you want to improve the economic conditions of younger people, improving their employment opportunities by retiring the older folks out of their jobs earlier uh, is probably a much better, much better bet. Uh, the second thing I would say maybe to encourage is that as a as as a minority, while you're still young, uh, they, uh, they the, the political power of a well-organized minority uh, is sometimes very substantial uh, because it has a focused view of its own interests uh, and uh and, and it can press for them, and that that probably is what is what is required in this situation in a democratic context is to have uh, a, a clear articulation of of those issues. And the only disadvantage for that, from your point of view, is uh, I regret to tell you you're not young forever, uh, so you'll have to continually renew uh, the uh, the pressure of, of of the young population on the whole system, uh, because by and large, sooner or later, you'll you'll just become like me, an older curmudgeonly character who uh when you reassess your interests in a uh, in a in a, in a sober-minded way you'll come you'll come to view the future the long-term future of the human species as well as something of interest but perhaps not immediately relevant to your own lifespan uh so to be aware while you're young and idealistic and have political energy use it because eventually you you know, it's just the outlook it just isn't all that great. <laughs> <laughs> On that merry note, I, I leave you. Thank you. <laughs>